this video we're going to introduce nuclear chemistry. So just as the name nuclear kind of implies, we're looking at changes in the nucleus. Um, most chemical reactions that we talk about are dealing with changes in the electrons, typically changes in the valence or outermost electrons. But in nuclear chemistry, we're looking at changes in the nucleus. Another way of calling a reaction a nuclear reaction when the nucleus changes is calling it a transmutation reaction. And why transmutation is because in these nuclear reactions, if you are changing the nucleus. So if you are changing the number of protons, you will be changing elements into different elements. So you might end up with carbon as a reactant and let's say oxygen as a product. Um, and you will not have the same elements on either side of your reaction that you might be used to. So let's um, recall a couple of facts that we're going to need to remember when dealing with nuclear reactions and nuclear chemistry. So take a moment, pause the video, try filling in the blanks yourself, and then check your work. So remember that the nucleus contains protons and neutrons. The number of protons is given by the atomic number. That's something that we can just look up in the periodic table. So if you have the element symbol, like carbon, um, and, or C for carbon, you can look up the number of protons and see that it should have six. The number of protons and neutrons is given by the mass number. That's something that's typically written in the symbol, like C12 or C13. That 12 or 13 is the mass number. It's the number of protons and neutrons added together. Isotopes are atoms of the same element with different numbers of neutrons. The numbers of protons would be the same, but the number of neutrons can vary, giving it different masses, again like C12 and C13. The number of protons always stays the same for each element. If this number changes, the atom becomes a different element. Take a moment, try this slide, pause the video, and then check your work. C12, C13, and C14 are all isotopes. They are atoms of the same element, all carbon, but they have different masses, and therefore they have different numbers of neutrons because we know their protons have to be the same. In order to be carbon, if we look it up, it has to have six protons. Another way of representing it is we can write the nuclear symbol with the element, and we have a top and bottom number. The top number is the mass number. The bottom number is the atomic number. So we can write this as 12 over 6, 13, 6, 14, 6. Notice the same number of protons, different mass numbers. Notice that we're not putting neutrons themselves anywhere in the, in the symbol, just the mass and the atomic number. So here's a reminder. Um, instead of calling this the atomic number, we could also say, hey, that remember, that's the nuclear charge, the charge of the nucleus. There's six protons. Each of them have a plus one. There's neutrons in the nucleus, too, but they have no charge. So sometimes we refer to this bottom number as the charge or nuclear charge. Okay. Um, C12 would have six protons, six neutrons. 12 minus six is six. C13, six protons, seven neutrons. C14, six protons and eight neutrons. Last recall slide. Take a moment, pause it, fill it in yourself, and then check your work. Helium with two neutrons is written as, we don't put the two neutrons themselves anywhere, but the mass number, the top number, would be a four because each neutron weighs one AMU. And each proton would weigh 1 AMU because if I look at helium, it has two protons because its atomic number is 2. So it would have a mass number of 4. And I could put that as the top left-hand number or I could put that mass number after the dash. These are two different ways of writing that particular atom. It has two protons and two neutrons. Each proton weighs 1 AMU. Each neutron weighs 1 AMU. So helium-4 would weigh 4 AMUs. And that's why this is called the mass number, because it represents the mass of that particular atom or isotope. So most nuclei that we look at are stable. But some of these isotopes or nuclei are not stable, and it all depends on the ratio of neutrons to protons. So the neutrons are kind of like the glue that holds the nucleus together, because otherwise, if you think about it, you have all positive charges grouped together in a small space of the nucleus. So how do those protons not repel each other and come apart? It's the neutrons that help glue it together. So you need the neutrons, and you actually need a certain ratio of neutrons to protons. If you don't have that ratio, you can not make a stable nucleus and it will start to what we call decay or emit particles. So 
at low atomic numbers, a one-to-one -one ratio is, is most stable at atomic numbers 20 and below. Um, but as you rise up, you need more and more neutrons to balance out the repulsion that you will have bet between pr uh, the protons. Again, protons are positive. So if you don't have these not the right number of neutrons, we say that this element or this atom is radioactive and it's going to have to decay or emit some type of radiation in order to get more stable. Um, so above atomic number 83, we really don't find any stable isotopes because there are not enough, um, that there is no ratio that is stable. The repulsion between the protons starts to become way too much at atomic number 83 when you put 83 protons and above, um, and they're all going to be radioactive. Any isotope that's radioactive we call a radioisotope. These are not stable, and they're going to start to do what we call decay. Um, so just here's kind of a visual. This graph is called the belt of stability. Okay, you'll see number of protons on the x-axis, number of neutrons on the y-axis. And if we're given one of these, you can always see if a nucleus is stable or unstable. So notice, like I said, below atomic, 20, uh, atomic number 20, 20 protons and below, a one-to-one -one ratio of neutron to protons is most stable. But beyond that, this starts to become outside the belt of stability. It's no longer stable. I need more and more neutrons to make this stable and hold this nucleus together. So if you are to plot the number of protons and neutrons, you have neutrons and protons, you find a point. If it falls within this belt or band of stability, we call it, then it's stable. If it falls outside of this belt or band of stability, it is unstable. So take a moment, pause the video, and I want you to, on this plot, find each of these three or answer these three questions. Okay, let's do this together. So a nuclide has 90 neutrons, 60 protons. So I go to 60, I go to 90, and I make a point there. I notice it falls within the belt of stability, so it's stable. It is not a radioisotope. It is not radioactive. It will not decay. It's stable. A nuclide has, a nuclide just means something that has a nucleus. A nucleide has 25 protons and 40 neutrons. Is this stable. So 25 is around here, 40 neutrons, just make sure you find the right thing in the right place, and here about around here. Notice it's outside the belt of stability, so it is not stable. It's unstable. We call that a radioisotope. It would be radioactive, and it would start to what we call decay. It's going to emit some type of radiation in order to try to make its way into this belt of stability. It's going to decay and emit radiation until it can get in this belt of stability. Um, so in doing so, it might it's going to undergo different nuclear reactions until it can turn into a different isotope. Which is more stable, C12 or C14? So C12 would have six protons, six neutrons. C14 would have six protons and um, eight neutrons. So if I plot them both, I'll see C14 is kind of out of this band of stability more. So I would say that C12 is much more stable. And if you remember, I said below atomic numbers 20, a one-to-one -one ratio is most stable. So this is just a, a tool that you should be able to do if I give you a belt or band of stability like this um, to be able to plot different um, isotopes and see if they are stable or not. Okay, um, and again the band of stability um, above atomic number 20 Okay, we start to see that this band of stability, a one-to-one -one ratio, is outside of the band of stability. So it's telling me that above atomic number 20, most stable isotopes are going to have more neutrons than protons. Okay, um, an unstable nucleus which spontaneously decays um, to form more stable products is called a radioisotope, as we said, and we can start writing these reactions. So when we write a decay re equation or a decay reaction, we're going to have just one reactant, meaning one thing on the left-hand side, and we're going to emit as products um, a couple of different options. You might see an alpha particle, beta particle, positron, and or gamma rays. These are going to be products, meaning they're going to be on the right-hand side when we write a decay equation. 
So you have this table called Table O, and you will always have this with you. Um, see the link to have a printable copy. Um, so this is an alpha. What an alpha particle looks like. It's essentially a helium four nucleus. It have a top number of four, a bottom number of two, and you can write it in one of these two different ways. These are the notations. Um, here's a beta particle. Notice I can either put an E or a, a, a Greek symbol beta as a symbol. This is gamma radiation. And these um, neutron and proton you're familiar with. This is just kind of writing what they are in what we call isotopic notation, where the mass is on the top and the charge is on the bottom. And that makes sense. A neutron has a mass of one and a charge of zero. That's something you already know. So notice that the top number is mass, the bottom number is charge of all of these symbols. A, an alpha particle has a mass of four, a charge of two. A proton has a mass of one, a charge of one. You know that. And this is a positron. So this is just some, this is in your notes, just summarizing what that table says. You don't have to memorize the table because you will always have access to it. So an alpha particle is really just a helium-4 nucleus. It's really just two protons and two neutrons. That's why it has a mass of four, which is the top number, a charge of two, which is the bottom number. So as long as you remember that mass is on top and, and charge is on bottom, you can know the mass and charge of these different particles, and you don't have to memorize this column over here. Okay, beta particle is really just kind of like an electron, but it's emitted from the nucleus. Um, the positron is similar to an electron. Oops, sorry, similar to an electron, it has a charge of a mass of zero, but it has a plus one charge. And a gamma ray right, has no mass, no charge. It's really just pure energy that's um, emitted when from a nucleus, um, and it's similar to an X-ray. Um, it just actually has more energy than an X-ray. Okay, the one thing that's not in table O that you should know is penetrating power. So because the helium-4 um, nucleus, the alpha particle, has the highest mass and the highest charge, um, it ha actually has the lowest penetrating power. It can't penetrate a lot of different materials. Gamma ray has no mass, no charge, it has pure energy. That has the highest penetrating power because there's really nothing holding it back. There's no mass, no charge. Um, so just as um, a reference, alpha particles, can be stopped by a thin sheet of paper. Beta particles can be stopped by a strip of aluminum. And gamma particles, you need a thick sheet of lead to really stop them from penetrating. And that's why, like, when you go get an x-ray and you have that, that heavy, like, lead um, uh, vest or something that they put on your body or mat, whatever, or blanket, whatever they use to cover up parts of your body they don't want exposed to the x-ray, um, it's because it's so heavy because it's a thick sheet of lead, essentially. So again, gamma being the highest penetrating power, alpha the lowest. Um, and again, like I said, from table O, all the information is on table O. You just have to remember that top number is mass, bottom number is charge. So table O lists the symbols used in nuclear chemistry, um, as long as you remember which has the greatest penetrating power, and you have to know what the top and bottom numbers mean. Top number is mass, so the mass of an alpha particle is 4. Bottom number is charge, so the charge of an alpha, of alpha particle is plus to. A lot of times positive is not indicated down there, so if I just see a number, I can assume it's positive. Okay, a negative would always be indicated. Take a moment and try this example. So the following shows an electric field. This part's positive, this part's negative. Look at the direction of what's happening with these particles. They're being emitted from a radioactive substance, and they are being deflected in some way based on this field. Tell me which one of these would be the alpha, which one would be the beta, and which would be a gamma based on how they're deflected. So notice this yellow one here is, is being deflected toward the positive. So what charge would that have? If it's being deflected toward positive, that would probably be negative. And if this green is being deflected toward the negative, that would most likely be positive. So this would be my beta, um, this would be my alpha, and the gamma, which have no mass and no charge, are not deflected at all. Since there's no charge, it's not attracted to positive or negative. Notice that the beta gets deflected even more than the alpha because it's lighter. It has no, char uh, no mass for the beta. The alpha has a mass of four, so um, the beta is going to be more easily deflected uh, more quickly.